Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Last week, we heard some verses from Mark chapter 7 where Jesus is quoting Isaiah, saying, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Now, at this point in Jesus' ministry, he's creating quite the stir with the dramatic miracles, exorcisms, and his dynamic preaching throughout the Galilean countryside. It was so dramatic that the Pharisees from the big city, Jerusalem, traveled out to come to Jesus. Not out of curiosity, however. The Pharisees had come loaded for big game. They had brought their lawyers, the the scribes, with them, and they were looking for dirt on Jesus. But instead of finding dirt on Jesus, instead, if you remember from last week or are familiar with the story, they found dirt on the disciples. Literally, dirt on the hands of the disciples. The disciples had not washed their hands before eating. They were walking through the fields and snacking on grain, which was completely legal according to the Torah. But the Pharisees were trying to bring them up on charges for this because, according to their tradition, they must wash their hands first. Now, it doesn't appear they were really going to lock Jesus up or anything like that, or maybe even fine him. But what they were trying to do was undercut Jesus' authority and his popularity. You see, part of Jesus' appeal was that he was viewed as a righteous man, a teacher with authority who taught better than the Pharisees and who pointed the people to God. However, the Pharisees' conception of God and the way they thought that you get in his good books was to... It was to follow the Torah laws, all of them, all of the Torah laws, plus some extra. They had made their own list, what they called the fence around the Torah. So not only do you not break these commandments, but if you follow our laws, you won't even get within 10 feet of breaking the commandments. And they thought that this was the way to be a good Jew and to fulfill what God wanted. However, Jesus' point is that the laws are not, and they never have been, frankly, the solution. You see, good rules do not make good people. Good rules don't necessarily make a society good. Because the problem is more profound than not knowing or following the right rules. But rules are what you know, we often focus on, and we, I can understand, because rules are concrete. They don't move. We can actually change them. And so that's often what the focus is, uh, perhaps an over-focus. One extreme position probably says about rules, make as many rules as you can. If it's legislate absolutely everything. If it's good, make it non-optional. If it's bad, make it illegal. The other side says, make as few rules as you can. Don't walk around with the stick you know where. Let people do what they want to do. But no matter what you're talking about, neither approach really gets to the heart of the matter or will really fix things. Now, don't hear me wrong. I'm all for good policies and good laws and freedom when we want the right mix, which is difficult to find sometimes. But while Good policies and laws, you know, they're often helpful and sometimes necessary. They are not enough. Even good laws won't completely fix things. The best solution to practically, I would say, all the problems in the world is not good laws, but rather good people. You can have the best laws in the world. But if you've got crooks and people with no conscience or no self-restraint, you'll still have problems. Laws are really, they're just like a Band-Aid. They they slow the bleeding, but they won't fix the wound. On the other hand, if you believe that all people can and do make bad and harmful decisions. You can't always trust them to do the right thing either. So we can't throw laws all the way out. Simply letting people choose is no guarantee people will 
choose well. The real issue, once again, comes back to people, to our hearts, and people are flawed. Now, Jesus always, and Yahweh for that matter, if you look at what Yahweh says, instead of just paying attention to little snippets or rules, if you listen to what Yahweh says, he's always cared more about the heart of, the human, of humanity than the outward gestures or the laws on the books. He says, you see, it's not the outside things that are the real source of danger for human beings. The root problem is not a law or a lack of a law. The root of the problem is human hearts and minds. Jesus tells the crowd, there's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. Now, Jesus' disciples apparently didn't get this either because when they go go off by themselves, they ask a follow-up question and Jesus says to them, Are you guys clueless too? Don't you get it? That a person cannot defile himself by what goes into him. Since a person's body gets rid of of its waste products. You know, in other words, he was hinting at it earlier. Now he pretty much comes out and says it. Physical poop comes out of your body. But that's not humanity's real problem. The real problem is the spiritual junk inside of you. What comes out of the inside of you, that, that is the dirt that bothers God. Because it's from within you that evil thoughts and desires originate. Sexual infidelity, scheming, assault, jealousy, harmful pride, nasty slander, etc., etc. In other words, the root issue is not laws. It's, well, you and me. It's the sinful inclination of the human heart. The biggest problem is not that humans be the biggest problem is not that human beings don't know what to do or that they're not sure what they should avoid. That can be part of the problem sometimes. But if that was the whole problem, simply educating people would fix it. But even the most well-educated people in the world still have issues, addictions, and they often some and sometimes they simply use their resources, learning, and advantages to exploit people on a larger scale. I mean, look at Hollywood or politics or Ivy League schools, or sports stars, and tell me that advantage and opportunity and education fix the problem. They don't. All human beings are capable of doing evil, no matter how smart or rich or likable they are. In many cases, that means knowing what to do is not enough. Now, again, I'm, I'm a big advocate of education. I want my kids to be well-educated. I really want all of you to understand the scriptures pretty well so you can know what Jesus is saying to you. It's important, but the core issue, the most fundamental problem we need to address is the sinful human heart. And that's also why, I, and I think I've sometimes envisioned it this way and it's sometimes talked about this way, That's also why sharing the good news is not simply a matter of education or simply telling a story. It's also calling people to repent and to trust. It requires, in Lutheran language, the use of both law and gospel. And until we can admit mistakes in ourselves, until we take seriously that repenting, well, we can't really satisfactorily fix the problems of the world. Like we say sometimes, you can't fix, until we can admit our own faults, we can't address other problems. In fact, I'd say any solution that doesn't take into account the sinfulness of humanity is going to be, at best, an incomplete solution. Heaven knows we aren't perfect. Even even the very best of rules is were handed down and we read in Deuteronomy the Ten Commandments among others, even those rules can only take you so far. They were intended to give life, but they never really could realistically for humanity. And we read the New Testament, we can see that clearly. Places like Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews among others tell us that straightforwardly. The law, even God's laws, failed to fix us. 
even rules made by God Almighty are not the antidote we need. But the law does do something important, as those verses tell us. The law shows us our need for a Savior. The good of the law is that it exposes sinful hearts. It shows us our sin. It shows us we need a new heart. Not just a pacemaker or not even a triple bypass surgery. We're talking more extreme than that. Jesus' teachings about the deceitful nature of the human heart harkens back to what prophets like Ezekiel or Jeremiah or even David say. The human heart cannot be fully trusted. It doesn't necessarily lean towards faithfulness, but it's prone to infidelity. Unfortunately, heart issues are almost always serious issues. No one likes to hear the heart is the problem, right? Nobody says, whew, at least it's only a heart issue, right? Nobody ever said that. No, any heart issue is a serious issue and one that you would do well to take seriously. The heart is serious and it's a problem beyond our ability to fix at least this level of the problem in human, in human hearts. You know, you can, you can do therapy, you can take medicine, but I don't think it's possible to perform heart surgery on yourself, right? You need someone else. Not just anyone either. You don't just want anyone performing that kind of surgery. You need a specialist. Thankfully, those same prophets who condemn the corrupt nature of the human heart also speak of a divine heart transplant. After being condemned for murder and adultery, David begs and cries, create in me a clean heart, O God. Ezekiel, and Jeremiah as well, but Ezekiel prophesies, I will sprinkle clean water on you. You shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will pour my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to be careful to obey my rules. That's what is required for the problem to be fixed. The new heart created by Christ and the Holy Spirit. You know, we're told elsewhere in Mark's gospel that Jesus knew human hearts. He saw what people are thinking. He saw the inside, not just the outward actions, as he was concerned here in this case, not just with outward, but with the inner, with the heart. And he sees our hearts as they really are, which is good because he is the surgeon, the divine healer. Jesus sees clearly what has to be done, and he can do it. When Jesus encountered illness in the Gospels, we know what happened. He removed it. He healed the lepers. He made uh, the mute speak and gave the blind sight. He even raised back to life smelly corpses and flatlining children. He declared the paralyzed man not only physically healed, but clean and forgiven. He forgave sins. And Jesus in the Gospels forgave them over and over and over. Jesus gives us a new heart. He was led by the Holy Spirit, and he promised to give his disciples new hearts in that same Holy Spirit. And so he has, giving us his Holy Spirit in the waters of baptism or when we believed. He transforms us from the inside out, healing our hearts and melting our hearts of stone with his compassion. And this is our solution. It's Jesus and the Holy Spirit are our starting point for living life and addressing all other problems. It's also our end goal and promised rest. We, knew, we need new hearts, and Jesus alone can give them to us. In fact, he has guaranteed a complete and full recovery on the day of the resurrection of all flesh, whilst when we shall emerge not only with new hearts, but new bodies and minds because of Jesus Christ, our great healer. In Jesus' name, amen.